What's up everybody, in today's video we're going to finish our series of all 50 high yield rapid review questions for the EOR exam and in today's video we'll cover OBGYN. These questions are straight from the NCCPA blueprint for your EOR exam but you can also use these questions for your pens prep so here we go. Question number one, snowstorm pattern on an ultrasound should make you think of what? Snowstorm pattern on ultrasound is hydatiliform mole. Number two, the most common type of gestational trophoblastic disease is, and that would also be hydrotiliform mole. So they can give you a stem and they're going to tell you about gestational trophoblastic disease and they're going to ask you what is the most common type and this is hydrotiliform mole. Number three, precedentia of the uterus refers to what? That would be complete prolapse of the uterus. So they're going to tell you partial, they're going to tell you complete, they can give you some other scenarios, but a complete prolapse of the uterus is precedentia. And you can see on the image here, there's a normal to the left, and complete prolapse on the right. Precedentia of the uterus, complete prolapse. Number four, which hormone is dominant in a luteal phase of menstruation? So they're going to give you a stem with a different dates. They're going to ask you about different hormones. And the hormone that is dominant in a luteal phase is progesterone. Number five. The most common type of GYN malignancy. And that would be endometrial cancer. So they're going to give you a stem with a different types of cancers. And they're going to ask you which one of these cancers is most likely the cause of GYN malignancy. And that would be endometrial cancer. Clinical breast exam screening is done how often? So they're going to give you a stem with a different uh, answers with a different time frames and the answer is clinical breast exam should be done every three years in a women age 20 to 39 years of age and then annually after the age of 40. So before 40, every three years, after 40, it's every year. What is the test of choice for uterine leomyoma for fibroids? The test of choice is a pelvic ultrasound. So they're going to give you a stem. Uh, the most commonly uh, affected race with leomyomas will be African-American females. And they're going to tell you this is an African-American female that comes in with a pelvic pain, XYZ. You figure out this is a fibroid. And they're going to ask you what's the next best test. And the answer is pelvic ultrasound. Eight. A tocolytic agent used in the treatment of preterm labor to suppress uterine activity. So they're going to tell you the patient comes in, it has a lot of uh, uterine activity, but you try to suppress that and you're going to use magnesium sulfate. So magnesium sulfate is a tocolytic agent used for treatment of preterm labor to suppress uterine activity. Number nine, what is the most common cause of postpartum fever sepsis? And that would be endo endometritis. Every time you see fever in a postpartum female, you should be thinking about endometritis. 10. What is the normal respiratory rate in the newborns? They're going to give you different uh, breaths per minute, and that would be 30 to 60 is normal for newborns. Number 11. Treatment of fibrocystic breast disease. So they're going to tell you a patient has fibrocystic breast disease and they're going to ask you what's the best treatment for this patient and that is going to be NSAIDs. They can also apply heat or ice, wear a sporty bra and decrease caffeine and chocolate. They can also ask you a question with the patient of fibrocystic, cystic, fibrocystic breast disease and which of these dietary XYZ should be reduced and if the answer has caffeine or chocolate then they should decrease those two in order to help with the fibrocystic breast disease. Number 12. Incompetent cervix is what? What is considered as an incompetent cervix? That would be when there is reported recurrent second trimester miscarriage. With a lot of second trimester miscarriage, the diagnosis is incompetent cervix. What is diagnosis of incompetent cervix? Well, to, uh, to diagnose that incompetent cervix, we're going to need an ultrasound. And an ultrasound will show the funneling of the cervix. So the answer is funneling of the cervix, ultrasound. So they may also give you a stem when they say a patient went uh, and got the ultrasound done and it showed the funneling of the cervix, 
that should make you think of incompetent cervix, most common cause of second trimester miscarriages. Number 14, treatment of incompetent cervix. So they're going to tell you a patient had funneling of the cervix on the ultrasound, prior reported miscarriage in the second trimester, and they're going to tell you what's the best treatment option for this patient, and that would be to treat it with a cervical uh, cerclage. Uh, it's going to be placed between 14 and 16 weeks. That's another question. Where can, uh, What time frame do we place the cervical uh, cerclage? That is 14 and 16 weeks. And again, another question could be when is it removed, and that would be 36 weeks to allow for delivery. And a circlage, this is a procedure when they stitch, uh, when you use the stitches to prevent delay over preterm birth. Number 15, mildly friable erythematous cervix with no active discharge. Should make you think of what? So it's going to be mildly friable. Uh, red cervix with active discharge should make you think of cervicitis. Classic features of an ectopic pregnancy are they're going to give you a stem with a different symptoms and to diagnose ectopic pregnancy, patient is going to come in with abdominal pain, you're going to have bleeding and adenexal mass in a pregnant woman. Adenexal mass, pain, bleeding should make you think of ectopic pregnancy. Number 17, a ring of fire sign in, in ectopic pregnancy is what? A ring of fire sign is an adenexal mass with gestational sac outside of the uterus. Number 18, beta ACG is greater than 1500, but no fetus in urethro. This should make you think of ectopic pregnancy. So you did a blood work, you find a beta ACG created in 1500, but an ultrasound, there's no fetus in the utero, that is ectopic pregnancy. All right, guys, all these questions can be found in my uh, PS study buddy and the rotation exam book. There's over 3,800 questions just like this, super high yield. That's going to significantly help you, your scores. Scan the code, check it out. The book is on Amazon. It's only 20 bucks. And for those of you that are turning to my channel, thank you very much for all your support. And for those of you that are new, please take a look around. There's video like this on every EOR, and I'm going to make video on every class for didactic here. You can use all these questions for studying for your pens. You guys are going to do great. And let's continue. 19. Methotrexate for a topic is only given when? They're going to give you a stem about methotrexate and ectopic pregnancy, and they're going to ask you when can we use this with a different answers. And you're going to say you can only use methotrexate if beta ACG is less than 5,000, ectopic mass is less than 3.5 centimeters, there's no fetal heart tone, and no folate supplements. If any of these are mentioned, let's say the beta ACG was 6,000, let's say the ectopic mass was four centimeters, then you're not going to use methotrexate, you're going to do a salpingectomy. Or they can ask you when do you use salpingectomy, and if any of these are present, greater than 5,000, ectopic mass greater than four centimeters, fetal heart rate, XYZ, patient reports, folate supplementation, salpingectomy is the answer. Gestational hypertension is what? A gestational hypertension is a blood pressure greater than 150 over 90 after 20 weeks of pregnancy that resolves 12 weeks postpartum. So another question they're going to ask you uh, when it comes to gestational hypertension, how long after uh, delivery can we expect this to resolve? And the answer is 12 weeks. And it's greater than 150 over 90 after 20 weeks gestational hypertension. 21. Preeclampsia is indication for immediate delivery, but not necessarily by cesarean section. So preeclampsia, baby needs to be delivered, but not necessarily by C-section. What medication is used in emergency contraception pill? So they're going to give you a stem with a different uh, medications, and for emergency contraception pill, it's levonorgestrel. When is the luteal phase of menstrual cycle? They're going to give you different time frames, and it's days 15 to 28. Luteal phase, 
15 to 28. Name some contraindications to OCPUs. So when it comes to the OCPUs, they should not be used in the women over 35 years of age who are smokers, patients that have a history of the blood clots, history of the breast cancer, or if they reported migraines with aura. Any of these is a contraindication for OCP, and by any one of these can be an answer to your question. Which OCP is safe in lactation can be used in the breastfeeding women? So this will be the mini pill, progestin only. So they're going to tell you a patient is lactating, uh, breastfeeding their baby, but they're interested in uh, OCP, and you're going to give them a mini pill, progestin only. Primary hypogonadism labs will show what? When it comes to primary hypogonadism, you're going to see high FSH and a low testosterone. High FSH, low testosterone is primary hypogonadism. <laughs> what hormone would be most definitive in diagnosing menopause in a 54-year-old female with amenorrhea? And that would be FSH level greater than 30. So if you have a lady in their 50s uh, with amenorrhea and you run the labs and they're going to ask you which one of these labs is most indicative of diagnosing menopause, it is FSH greater than 30. These cysts are presumed to be malignant until proven otherwise. That would be postmenopausal ovarian cysts. So they're going to give you a stem, and they're going to tell your patient underwent uh, exam. You found uh, ovarian cysts. Uh, this is a postmenopausal female, and this is presumed malignant till proven otherwise. What must be considered in a female patient complaining of feeling of bulge in a vagina and a pelvic pressure? So patient comes in uh, on a physical exam, they report bulging and pressure in their vagina. And this is urine prolapse cystocele. So with a cystocele, any feeling of bulge in vagina and a pelvic pressure, cystocele should be higher in differential diagnosis. Unilateral nipple discharge is more commonly associated with what? Only from one side that is considered intraductal papilloma. So on a physical exam, everything seems to be normal, uh, but you report a unilateral nipple discharge, intraductal papilloma. Treatment for primary dysmenorrhea. NSAIDs, ibuprofen, leave, so forth. Primary amenorrhea causes. So this will be hypotolemic hypogonadism is a common in runners and eating disorders seen with the young women. So primary amenorrhea, you're going to tell this patient is a runner, young athlete, so forth, and you should be also thinking about hypothalamic hypogonadism. Methotrexate mechanism of action. So known different mechanisms of actions is easy to make questions around. So known the major medications mechanisms of actions can also help you improve your scores. So when it comes to the methotrexate, it is a folic acid antagonist and inhibits the DNA synthesis. Methotrexate mechanism of action, folic acid antagonist, inhibits DNA synthesis. Number 34, the histologic finding of the plasma cells in the endometrial stroma is indicative of chronic endometritis and can be linked with infertility. So they're going to tell you the histological report reports plasma cells in the stroma and you should be thinking of endometritis. Screening for a group B streptococcus is performed between which weeks in pregnancy? So when it comes to the group B strep screening, this is done between 35 and 37 weeks of pregnancy. So you can see how they can give you different weeks. Knowing the screening for group B streptococcus between 35 and 37 will always give you the right answer. Group GBS treatment. Group B streptococcus treatment is penicillin G during the labor. So they're going to ask you when should the penicillin G be delivered or administered for a GBS treatment, and that is penicillin G during the labor. 37. Women with epilepsy have an increased incidence of neural tube defects. 
So if the stem, they said the patient has history of the epilepsy, and which one of these is the increased risk for, and that would be neural tube defect. Explain the follicular phase progression. So knowing the progression of the follicular phase can help you with the correct answer, and it's FSH stimulates the development of the primary ovarian follicle, followed by the follicle produces estrogen, estrogen causes uterine lining proliferation, estrogen surge causes LA surge, which stimulates the ovulation on day 14. Again, follicular phase progression. FSH stimulates development of the primary ovarian follicles first, Follicles produce estrogen, then estrogen causes uterine lining proliferation, which in turn causes estrogen surge, causes LH surge, which stimulates the ovulation on a day 14. When does the luteal phase begin? After the ovulation and the remnant of the follicle develops into corpus luteum. So luteal phase after ovulation. Number 40. What are two phases of the ovarian cycle? Ovarian cycle two phases are follicular, days 1 to 14, and a luteal, 14 to 28. Corpus luteum produces what? And produces progesterone to maintain endometrium to receive fertilized ovum. So, corpus luteum, progesterone. During fertilization, trophoblasts secrete ACG to maintain what? To maintain corpus luteum. What is the term used to describe heavy or prolonged bleeding? When it comes to the prolonged bleeding, menorrhea, know the terms. So, menomenorrhea, menorrhagia, menorrhagia is heavy or prolonged bleeding. Menorrhagia, prolonged bleeding, heavy bleeding. What is the term used to describe the cycle which has the length of greater than 35 days? That would be oligomenorrhea. Oh, that's a long cycle. So that's the way I remember this. When they talk about cycles and the cycle being greater than 35 days, I'll just think like, oh, that is a long cycle. Oh, for oligo. Oligomenorrhea. What is the term used to describe cycle which has the length less than 21 days? And that would be polymenorrhea. Polymenorrhea, less than 21 days. What is the term used to describe the absence of menses for six months? Amenorrhea. So they reported absence of menses for greater than six months. That is amenorrhea. What is the term used to describe the cycle which has irregular cycles? Metrorragia. Metrorragia, bleeding between regular periods. So you can see how they can describe bleeding greater than 35 days, less than 21 days, uh, bleeding between the cycles, so metrorragia, bleeding between the regular periods. Heavy irregular bleeding describes what? Menometrorragia. So heavy irregular menometrorragia. Just heavy bleedings is a metrorragia, but heavy irregular is menometrorragia. Most common cause of dysfunctional uterine bleeding will be fibroids. Most common cause of dysfunctional urine bleedings, fibroids, pelvic ultrasound. And the last question, guys. Patient with the Graves and the PCOS have what kind of cycle? They have oligomenorrhea. Oh, that's a long cycle, grade 35. Graves disease, that's going to be... A sign with the eyes pretty much popping out, PCOS, and there's going to cycle, we're going to be oligomenorrhea. This is 50 questions straight from the book. Hit that subscribe button, help me grow this channel. You guys are going to do great, and you guys are almost done. You can use this question study for your pens. I always tell myself, thousands and thousands of people have done this before me, so can I, period. You guys got this, you'll do great. Hit that like button, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, guys. Bye. Best of luck.